Good afternoon. My name is Lisa Itzkowitz, and I uh, handle marketing at the New Rochelle Public Library. Thank you all for joining us for today's program, The Mushrooms of Violetta White Delafield, uh, in honor of Women's History Month, and because we're fortunate enough to have an amateur mycologist on staff. Um, before we get started, I just want to make a few announcements. We have tons of programs going on throughout the month of March and always. I just wanna highlight two programs we're doing in honor of Women's History Month. We have a concert tomorrow and all female, female a cappella group will perform at three o'clock uh, tomorrow at the library. And on Tuesday night, we're doing a virtual tour of a New York Historical Society exhibit called Women's Work. And you can find details on how to register for all our programs on our website, nrpl.org where you can also sign up for our newsletter. Our weekly newsletter highlights the events that are coming up. And as I said, we have much more than what I just mentioned. And you can follow us if you're on social media. We are on Facebook and Instagram, and we are constantly posting what's going, at the, going on at the library on those two platforms as well. Today's program will last about 45 to 50 minutes. After that, we will take questions and answers. So we just ask if you have questions, put them in the chat. You can put them in as they occur to you. They may get answered, they may not, but at the end I will uh, go through and David will answer as many questions as uh, we're able to. With that, I wanna to present today's presenter. David Rose. David is the archivist at the New Rochelle Public Library, and as I mentioned, is also an amateur mycologist and a contributing editor to the Journal of Fungi. And with that, I'm going to turn the program over to David. Um, tell us all he can about Violetta White Delafield. Thanks, David. Thank you, Lisa. And welcome, everyone, to today's Zoom presentation. Uh, this is in honor of Women's History Month at the New Rochelle Public Library, and um, I have to tell you that there are a couple of other things that are going on in my archival world relating to that, and that's um, um, a display that was created in our lobby for the League of Women Voters of New Rochelle, whose archive was the, actually the first archive I organized when I came on board to the library, and we also have other... Um, uh, other collections having to do with women, uh, the Women's Club of New Rochelle, and a favorite of mine, the papers of Elizabeth Huntington Coley Fox, who was an overlooked artist and school teacher in the history of New Rochelle. So that's a part of our collection. Uh, today is, I, I'm really going to give you two talks today. The one on Violetta White Delafield is the featured one, but I realize that there are people in the audience um, who know a lot about mushrooms, and there may be people in the audience who really are, are novices to the world of mycology. So I wanted to give you a sort of mycological overture to begin with. Uh, so um, you're getting two, um, two presentations for the price of one and both are free. Um, I also have to say that my presentation on Violetta White Delafield will be read from a prepared text, but the first part will not. So let's get started. If you're interested in mushrooms, you don't need much more than a small knife, a basket, a mushroom guide, and a forest or a woods to look for mushrooms in. And there are plenty of suburban areas too. So that's an ind individual approach to looking and understanding at the world of fungi. But um, what I wanted to do is take you through a couple of steps of a kind of an, an experiential understanding of what this is all about. So I've been studying fungi with my wife for 30 years, actually. And we've been members of the Connecticut Westchester Mycological Association. So the baskets you see here could be from a hike of one of, one of our club's hikes and forays looking for mushrooms. But if you really get into it, you might join a mycological club and go on a four day foray in which you have 80 or 100 people out in the woods looking for mushrooms with professional mycologists who will identify them all for you. And this is just, an just a portion of a collecting table at a foray several years ago. Uh, there could be as many as half a dozen or a dozen large tables filled with vouchered specimens and descriptions of mushrooms that get 
um, identified, discussed, and some of them get eaten. And that's something that brings people to mycology quite a lot is the fact that um, unlike bird watching, you usually don't say, well, can I eat that? Can I eat that bird? Uh, when people look at mushrooms and find mushrooms, the first thing they ask is, can, you, can I eat that? Is it edible? And this is a basket of morels, Morchella esculenta, and perhaps some other species of morels that have been washed and prepared for eating. Um, so this is a big attraction. And uh, without question, it's something that brings people to mycology as much as the science and art uh, do. Um, if you're really interested in mycology and you really get into it, then you buy a microscope. And this is also Morchella esculenta, but each one of these elongated pods you see here is an ascus. It's a kind of a, a, a bag and each one of them, and it's a microscopic structure, each one of them has eight spores. If you count them, each one of these elongated structures has, has eight, eight spores and it belongs. So Morchella esculenta and many other mushrooms belong to a group called ascomycetes because they have this structure. And there's another great group called basidiomycetes that have spores that are born on structures called basidia. So if you really want to know about identifying mushrooms at the microscopic level, this is, this is very important. I really never got into um, investigating mushrooms and trying to identify them with a microscope, but uh, some do, and it's an added experience to the whole thing. Now, some people use mushrooms to create art. What you see here is the, the bottom of a shelf fungus, Ganoderma aplanatum, also known as the artist conch. It grows on the side of trees. It's like a little shelf. And this one is especially interesting to many people because you can actually poke the, 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 the porous surface with a pin or a knife and create uh, uh, pictures that will last. And this is a poly, this is the polypore, uh, the artist conch uh, with artwork of Marie Herkins. Uh, and she has drawn, or if she used a pin, um, uh, created this scenario of another mushroom, Ammonita muscaria, on the bottom of this fungus. And this is something that, you know, is one of many introductions to the world of mushrooms through creating art. And there are so many others. This is the artwork of a German artist, Karsten Hollis, which really brings me to the subject of how, my how amateur mycology has changed in the last 30 years. I think in the last 10 or a dozen years, social media has really uh, caused an explosion of interest in mycology. And this is an example of that. I think mushrooms as a metaphor, mushroom mycelia as a metaphor for um, the internet and interest in using mushrooms for myco remediation, helping the environment are all parts of how amateur mycology has changed. And you forever see this iconic mushroom, Ammonita muscaria, the fly agaric, classic red cap with white dots, which are parts of the universal veil that was attached to it as it grew. And uh, this has importance in a, lot of, in a lot of ways and we'll return to it a couple of times today. Mushrooms are beautiful. There are more colors represented in the world of fungi than in the world of flowers. And this is a bolete. It has a it's uh, has a, has a cap, and the underside of that cap has little pores with tubes in which the spores are ejected. And this was found in Neptune Park in New Rochelle. Among this group of boletae, the species here is Boletus subvolutipes. So it doesn't take really a walk in the woods. You can walk around the block and find a lot of things. And this is something that I found in my neighborhood just walking around one summer, as is this. This is um, half of a fairy ring. The, the fungus, the vegetative part of the fungus is underground. You can't see it. The mushrooms are the fruiting body of this fungus. So this fungus is at least as a couple yards wide underground. 
And this one is the green sport Lepiota, Chlorophyllum molybdides. Um, and it's, you know, some people think it's a mushroom weed. It grows so prolifically. And a good thing to know about it is that it is toxic. There are many species of Lepiota, a genus of um, white spored mushrooms, except for this one. So they removed it from the genus Lepiota and put it in the genus Chlorophyllum, which means green, green gill. And uh, as you can see in the photo on the right, uh, the, gills, the gills below are turning green. They don't always appear green at first, so you have to be careful. There is one Lepiota that looks like this that is an edible mushroom. This one is not, so you don't want to make a mistake of confusing them. And in order not to confuse them, you make a spore print. All you have to do is cut the, cut the stem off, put the cap down on a piece of white paper and cover it with a bowl. And within six or 10 or 24 hours, the spores, each one of which is microscopic, rain down on the paper in such profusion that um, they make a, an, an interesting um, piece of art actually. And the color is important. So it's not that the spores have uh, landed on the paper. It's the fact that you can tell the color and the color of the spores from knowing that from a spore print is an important diagnostic characteristic of mushroom identification. Now, another inroad into mycology is through ecology and physiology. This is a really interesting scene. There are oyster mushrooms, Pleurotus ostriatus, growing all around this stump. And what you see in yellow on the top, you may say, oh, someone shot a paintball at that stump. Not so. That is a myxomycete, a slime mold. It is one, that is one single cell, believe it or not. It moves along the surface of the stump by a process called plasmodial streaming. And all of the nuclei in this are, are just, are swimming around until at a chemical signal, it starts to send up little vegetative um, fruiting bodies and producing spores to make this happen all over again. Uh, this is not a mushroom. It's in a totally different kingdom, actually, but it's been studied by mycologists so often that we include it in our instructional literature and the fun we have in identifying these things. So here's a, a, a small ensemble of mushrooms that I collected a couple of summers ago, and you can see uh, two or three ammonitas at the top. You can see a bolete down at the bottom. And the two large ones are puffballs. And this leads us into the subject of gastromycetes, which is what Violetta White Delafield studied uh, when she was studying mycology. So here we have a very large mushroom and you say, wow, that's, that's, that's pretty large. Um, would you believe it gets that large? I have heard that some people driving by one of these, seeing them in a field, have mistaken them for sheep, which is, I think, pretty funny. But this is Calvatia gigantea, and it is a large edible puffball. This might be too tough to eat because it's um, because it is what it is. But um, gastromycetes don't release their spores from gills, as in the gilled mushrooms or through tubes as in the boletes and polypores, They're, they have to invent other methods of spore dispersal because the spores are in the mushroom. Um, they, the gastromycete simply means stomach fun, fungus. So um, that is Calvatia gigant gigantea. Here's another Calvatia, Calvatia craniformis, named because it looks like a cranium. It's cut in two. I've actually witnessed uh, a specimen of this pushing up through the asphalt of a parking lot. It has that much pressure and power as it grows. Um, this is an odd one, Calistoma cinnabarina. It's always fun to find this in the deep woods. This is a, a kind of a gooey mess and it can grow in great profusion, but this is a kind of stalked puffball. Now, who needs science fiction when you have this? This is... Um, Calistoma lutescens, which is a really odd one. I've only seen it a few times, probably on a mushroom foray with uh, uh, my club, Coma, but this is really a, 
a, a, a fantastic thing to see in the woods. Uh, this is a photo that I took myself of Tula Stoma uh, Brum Brumali, which, which you can find in winter. And I actually found this on Christmas Day several years ago uh, near Richmond, Virginia. Uh, these the stems on this one are are kind of woody, but you see at the very top there's a there's a pore, uh, there's a little opening, and the spores are ejected from that in this particular species. So another gastromycete, very common, Lycoperdon perlatum, uh, the the very common puffball. It can grow singly or in clusters like this. This is a bird's nest fungus, also a gastromycete, and it, you can see how it got its name. Uh, the scientific name for this whole group is Nidulariales, but what you what you see um, that look like eggs are not eggs. They're little structures called peridioles, and the spores are inside those little round things. And its method of spore dispersal is to open its cap, show the peridioles, and let it rain. And when it rains, the water droplets splash those peridials out, they break open and release their spores. So if you ever take the time to stop at a <clears throat> corporate park with lots of wood chips around the shrubbery, you can see these mushrooms in great profusion. This is a stinkhorn. Um, its method of spore dispersal is really to have a, 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 smelly, a smelly top covered with this gooey slime that flies are attracted to, and then the flies release all the spores. And this is a geaster, geaster cicatum, which is a remarkable fungus. It too releases spores from, a, um, from, from the middle, that little middle structure there. And you can also get into mycology through the subject of history. <clears throat> and that's, that's what I enjoy the most. Uh, several years ago, I wrote an article about uh, an unfortunate mushroom poisoning in Washington, D.C. that occurred in 1897. And through a USDA investigation, it was found that in Washington, uh, there were African-American market women who brought these four species to market and sold them at the K Street Market in Washington, D.C. They're all edible. And um, only one of them is puff of puffball, and that's the one in the lower right-hand corner. The others are fairly common mushrooms, but uh, you know we we all know what's available in our supermarket. But you'll never find these in your, in the supermarket. The closest is the button mushroom that everyone knows. Uh, it's very close to Agaricus campestris on the upper left. Now, getting into the subject of my, mycology and history, this, I mean, every one of these slides could turn into an, 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 its own lecture. This is a, um, a fateful encounter between a man who was a wealthy banker, R. Gordon Wasson, who, with his wife, Valentina Wasson, wrote a very important book called Mushrooms, Russia, and History that was published in 1957. Most of the book was not about Russia. It was about his encounter with a Mazatec curing, um, a cure, uh, healer by the name of Maria Sabina. And she was she used um, a hallucinogenic mushroom, a psychoactive mushroom to, to pray and for, for curing uh, when people came to her when they were ill. Uh, she, she and the Mazatecs lived in and around Oaxaca, Mexico. And when Robert Gordon Wasson discovered her and discovered what her mushrooms did, he not only wrote this massive book, Mushrooms, Russia and History, but wrote a book called In Search of the Magic Mushroom, which appeared in Life magazine. And it, it really catapulted the whole subject of hallucinogenic mushrooms into a mainstream where um, it really launched um, a, a um, a countercultural movement. In fact, it was said that there are stories that among the many so-called God seekers that then went to Oaxaca to see if they could find such mushrooms, that people like Jim Morrison from The Doors and John Lennon and Bob Dylan all went to Oaxaca. And I don't know the, the validity of those stories, but the Mazatec culture in um, Oaxaca was really changed by, by this encounter between 
a very sophisticated civilized man and a primitive group which which had great beauty and the 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 songs and the chants that she used to reach through the spirit world to to heal the sick were um something that was in, indigenous to to this particular healer and it had it had a ripple effect through american culture in some of the oddest ways the the poet Ann Waldman, for instance, who with Allen Ginsberg founded the Jack Kerouac School for Disembodied Poetics, wrote a, a long poem called Fast Speaking Woman, which was modeled on Maria Sabina's chanting in uh, in this mushroom ceremony called the Mazatec Balada. Uh, again, that's a whole story. But what I am trying to do as I go along here is give you some um, insight into women in the world of mycology. And you wouldn't call Ann Waldman a mycologist. She was certainly a wonderful poet, but, um, but there are more. And one last thing <clears throat> about Robert Gordon Wasson. He wrote another um, really well-known book, Soma, the Divine Mushroom of Immortality, which was about Amanita muscaria and its use in uh, Siberian cultures and in, um, in the Hindu Rig Veda. So that, I don't know as a conclusive um, a finding, but but it, but it's a famous finding in terms of amateur mycology. He was not a professional mycologist. He was an amateur. There was another person who was an amateur mycologist who I have written about, and that's John Cage, the composer. Uh, John Cage was a um, probably one of the most radical revolutionary composers in US history in the 20th century because he redefined what it meant to what silence meant. He's very famous for a piece, well, he's written so many pieces, but famous for the piece, four minutes and 33 seconds. And in that piece of music, a pianist sits down before a piano and in three movements that totally last four minutes and 33 seconds, plays absolutely nothing. And everyone thought that this was fraudulent, a joke, and I shouldn't say everyone, but many people thought that it was it was just a hoax, and it was not, because what he was trying to do was focus on non-intentional sound. He redefined silence as non-intentional sound. So intentional sound is the music that we make, that we create, but non-intentional sound is all around us. And a favorite poem of mine from John Cage goes like this. I have nothing to say, and I am saying it, and that is poetry. Poetry is the realization that we possess nothing. Anything, therefore, is a delight, since we do not possess it, and thus need not fear its loss. Now, John Cage became uh, the, the, the third founder of the New York Mycological Society. He was very involved in mushroom identification and forays in the 1960s and 70s, and with the uh, um, artist Lois Long and the mycologist Alexander Smith, he produced a book called Mushroom Book. And his writing is overwritten, as you see on the right, uh, which was he, was, he was mimicking the way you hunt mushrooms in the woods. Sometimes you find them, sometimes you don't. Sometimes you have to go back and forth to find them. And, um, this, this, I think, is a, was, was one of his stellar achievements in the realm of mycology because what was his inspiration to redefine silence was hunting mushrooms in the woods, that, that mushrooms are like musical notes, that they could be found and, and the ones you're looking for, they're never found, but the ones you're not looking for, you find them everywhere. So um, this is another stimulus to people's imagination that led them to appreciate mushrooms all the more. This is one of the illustrations from Mushroom Book by Lois Long. Unfortunately, I don't have a photo of Lois Long herself, but I do have another photo of John Cage. <clears throat> this, I believe, was taken at a New York Mycological Society affair. I do not know the, uh, the identity of the man on the right, but um, I do know the woman who is in, in the background, and that is Sylvia Stein. And Sylvia Stein was my mentor. She mentored me and my wife and my children in the fascinating pursuit of mushroom identification. 
and um, she was a friend of John Cage. See, they they met when they studied. Uh, they took a course in mycology at the New York Botanical Garden under Clark Rogerson back in the 1960s. And she went on many walks with John Cage. So she had plenty of stories to tell us about that. But she was um, uh, she was very feisty and a lot of fun. And uh, when there were no mushrooms to be found, she would botanize. And I remember one time <clears throat> we were lamenting that we were on a hike and there were really no mushrooms around. And she was looking at a dandelion through a lens sitting on a rock. And I said, oh, Sylvia, that's just a dandelion. She said, don't you ever say, don't you ever say that it's just a dandelion. Come here and look at this flower. That's the kind of person she was. She was she was magnetic. She knew her mushrooms. There was nothing you could, no mycological entity that you could bring her that she couldn't identify. And the photo on the left is um, Sylvia with the, the edible polyporous umbilatus. And, and on the right, a uh, really odd thing, a mushroom that's been parasitized by another fungus. Uh, one last thing, there, there is, of course, has been an explosion of interest in psychoactive mushrooms. Uh, I have to say that I, uh, this disclaimer, I'm not endorsing or recommending any of this, but the Telluride Mushroom Festival that occurs annually each August in Telluride, Colorado, uh, features a lot of people who are interested in that, including the founders. On the left, Gary Linkoff, uh, who we also knew and uh, who was a uh, wonderful educator about mycology and um, Dr. Emanuel Saltzman, who were founders of the uh, Telluride Mushroom Festival that still continues to this day. My recent research in the history of mycology led to writing an article about this gentleman, Roland Thaxter, who uh, studied a rather odd group of mushrooms called the Labulbeni ailes, which parasitized insects and the illustration on the right are his drawings. He identified thousands of species of these things that each one had a more fantastic, bizarre shape and structures with all these brush-like filaments, um, almost microscopic. Some of the, most of these are like one millimeter tall. So it's not very large for a fungus. But uh, why I bring him up was his mother was very famous, Celia Thaxter. I don't know how many of you know the poetry of Celia Thaxter. She was one of the most well-known female poets in the 19th century, more so than even Emily Dickinson. And um, my, my article about Roland Thaxter concentrated on his background with, uh, with art and poetry with his, in his family. So enough of that. And so we have reached the entract. And now I'm going to revert to my text-based talk on Violetta. Just a word before I start. Um, I, what I found about Violetta White Delafield was the result of, of poking around in a lot of archives. First of all, the New York Botanical Garden archive where I worked uh, some 20 years ago. And um, the archive of historic Hudson Valley, which was subsequently uh, transferred to Montgomery Place and Bard College. There was also the Delafield family collection at Princeton University that I looked at in the uh, archive and, and uh, library of the Garden Club of America. So it took a lot of archival reconnaissance to pull all of this together. And um, I will say no more, but I will begin. So this image is the result of a chance operation. My random photo of a loose sheaf of notes and onion skin, skin sketches by Violetta White Delafield. The photo was taken at the New York Botanical Garden while examining an archival collection of her mycological writings. I present this image as an emblem of archival reconnaissance, a kind of archeological excavation that traces the stratigraphy of documents left by Mrs. Delafield. This talk will examine my pursuit of those traces as an adventure in biography. Biography is an essential window into history. In this case, the history of mycology. In Footsteps, Adventures of a Romantic Biographer, Richard Holmes explains biography as, quote, a kind of pursuit 
a tracking of the physical trail of someone's path through the past, a following of footsteps. He tells us, you would never quite catch them. No, you would never quite catch them. But maybe if you were lucky, you might write about the pursuit of that fleeting figure in such a way as to bring it alive in the present, to produce the living effect from dead fact. End of quote. Holmes calls this process a haunting, an act of deliberate psychological trespass, an invasion or encroachment of the present upon the past, and in some sense, the past upon the present. He concludes, in this experience of haunting, I first encountered what I now think of as the essential process of biography. I began to haunt Mrs. Delafield in 1996, two years after my first encounter with mushrooms, when I read this article, Historic Tours Focus on Women in the New York Times. Two years later, my work as archivist at the New York Botanical Garden plunged me directly and deeply into the private letters and public arguments of dozens of botanists and mycologists. And so I began to haunt them all as they began to haunt me. I found mushrooms fascinating, but people who study and love the fungi, the most fascinating of all. According to the State of the World's Fungi Report of the Royal Botanical Garden at Kew in 2023, there are in excess of 2 million species of fungi that exist globally. Over 90% are unidentified. Over the years, known species have acquired multiple names and taxonomic changes exasperating to the amateurs. So, Mrs. Most so too, Mrs. Delafield has appeared under several names. She was born Susan Elizabeth White in Florence, Italy, May 10th, 1875. Her nursemaid admired her deep blue eyes and called her Violetta. As V.S. White, she authored three important studies of fungi in 1901 and 1902. With V.S.W. Dell, that is Delineawit, she claimed authorship of the mycological artwork in those publications. In 1904, she changed her name legally to Violetta in advance of her marriage to John Ross Delafield to become Violetta White Delafield. For the balance of her life, she was Mrs. Delafield, or according to the patriarchal conventions of the age, Mrs. John Ross Delafield. Privately, she was called Dolly by her husband and Letty by her sisters. Her complete name was Violetta Susan Elizabeth White Delafield. Now, Violetta studied the gastromycetes, puffballs, earth stars, stock puffballs, and birds in this fungi, unlike the gilled mushrooms we see here. We now turn to the mycologist that benefited Violetta in her quest to know the gastromycetes. In a patriarchy, the father is the figurehead of power. We know Louis David von Schweinitz as the putative father of mycology, but here's the mother, Mary Elizabeth Banning. She studied fungi in Maryland and was taunted by street urchins as the mushroom lady. Female scholars whose research papers I organized at the New York Botanical Garden Archive included Gertrude Burlingham, an expert on Lactarius and Rushula, and Alma Barksdale, who studied the genetics of the water mold Aclea. Mary Banning donated her portfolio of watercolor illustrations in the Fungi of Maryland to the New York State Museum into the care of Charles Horton Peck. That work is an extraordinary compendium of 174 watercolor illustrations of common mushrooms. Charles Horton Peck was the first New York State botanist and the go-to authority on the fungi in the 19th century. In 1868, he joined the staff of the New York Cabinet of Natural History, later the State Museum. And by the way, at the very beginning of his tenure, it was just a cabinet, a cabinet filled with a few natural history specimens. In the absence of convenient mushroom guides, oh, I'm sorry, Peck's mushroom discoveries were widely known through the publication of annual reports of the State Museum. And in the absence of convenient mushroom guides, hundreds of people wrote to him for these reports. Over the course of his lifetime, 
He identified, named, and illustrated over 2,700 species of fungi. In the 1890s, he focused more on edible and poisonous mushrooms to educate a public increasingly interested in mycophagy, that is, the eating of mushrooms. John Cage took note of Peck's work, observing that his desk was once in the hallway of the museum, an indication of the inferior position of mycology in the hierarchy of the sciences. Nathaniel Lord Britton and Lucian Underwood were the first lords, so to speak, of the New York Botanical Garden. Britton founded the, the, the garden in 1891, devoted to the complete botanical reconnaissance of the Americas and the Caribbean. A humorless and driven man, his watchword to his staff was, get it into print. He drew the support of Andrew Carnegie, J.P. Morgan, and Cornelius Vanderbilt to grow his botanical empire. In the 1890s, he propounded the American Code of Botanical Nomenclature that rigidly insisted on priority of names for plants and fungi. Britain's American Code was rejected or ignored by the bulk of American mycologists, some of whom believed it to be an unnecessary and self-serving ploy to upset taxonomic logic and nomenclatural reasonableness. Lucian Underwood succeeded Britain as professor of botany at Columbia University. He was chairman of the board of scientific directors at the garden. One of Britain's key lieutenants, Underwood was an expert of ferns and hepatics. In 1899, he published Molds, Mildews, and Mushrooms, which helped to popularize mycology just at the moment that Violetta White entered the field. As editor of the Bulletin of the Tory Botanical Club, he was instrumental in publishing Violetta's scientific writing. In 1907, tragedy struck. Distraught after losing money in a business deal, Underwood attempted to murder his wife and ended up committing suicide at their home in Reading, Connecticut. Britain was aghast beyond measure at this loss, which not only provide, pro deprived him of a brilliant botanical colleague, but interrupted the garden's publication project of the North American flora. Here's the mycologist that gave the world its first metrosexual beard. William Alfonso Merle had the reputation as a charming Southern gentleman, a parlor room pianist who styled himself the naturalist. He expanded our knowledge of agarics, boletes, and polypore, yet was reviled by some as a splitter who slavishly followed Britain's American code. In 1904, as staff mycologist of the New York Botanical Garden, Murrow identified the fungal pathogen that began killing chestnut trees in New York. His most visible legacy is Mycologia, still the premier journal of mycology in North America. He established the Yama Farms Mycological Club at a Catskill resort 20 miles west of Poughkeepsie and enticed Henry Ford, Thomas Edison, the DuPont family, and the Bengali poet Rabindranath Tagore into the pleasures of mycology. He installed the naturalist John Burroughs as honorary president. After a hospitalization in France in 1918, when he was incommunicado with the garden for six months, he fell out of grace with Britain and was demoted to supervisor of public instruction, a crushing blow to his self-esteem. He tendered his resignation one day in 1923, left New York, and was never seen at the garden again. He dropped out entirely and might never have re-entered the world of mycology were it not for a chance meeting. Dr. George Weber of the University of Florida happened to recognize an unshaven, dirty, and disoriented man playing piano in a crowded pavilion of the Tin Can Tourist Camp in Gainesville, Florida. The man at the piano was William Alfonso Merle. Curtis Gates Lloyd was an upstart and a maverick a loose cannon in mycology. He was based in Cincinnati, heir to the Lloyd brothers' pharmaceutical fortune, and probably more knowledgeable about gastromycetes than anyone in the field at the time. A cranky perfectionist without affiliation, he self-published the magazine Mycological Notes for over two decades. Lloyd ridiculed the practice of adding an author's name to a species name as a personal advertisement even though he created over 1,000 new names himself 
and he mercilessly teased mycologists and botanists for doing so. He called them name jugglers. He even invented a fictitious mycologist, Professor McGinty, and added McGinty's name to otherwise valid species names, and some mycologists believed that Ginty was real. In Lloyd's cantankerous worldview, he stated, quote, it is my belief, and I think it will so impress anyone who investigates the history of mycology, that there has not been another subject that has been so crudely, blunderingly, carelessly, and inaccurately exploited as this subject, end of quote. I have some sympathy with that opinion, but certainly not with the style and perspectives and mannerisms of Monsieur Lloyd himself. A few years before he died, he erected a large granite monument with the epitaph, Curtis G. Lloyd, monument erected in 1922 by himself, for himself, during his life to gratify his own vanity. What fools these mortals be. Violetta Susan White was born to wealthy expatriate parents in Italy. She attended the Brearley School in Manhattan for two years, from 1890 to 1892. That was the extent of her classroom education. Otherwise, she was tutored and self-educated. She returned to Paris to study piano and back to the US to begin a self-study of botany. It is likely that her observation of nature began at the White family home in Litchfield, Connecticut. Her brother, Elaine Campbell White, was a chess composer and botanist, an authority on succulent plants, who with their sister, Margaret May Whitlock White, founded the White Memorial Foundation in Litchfield, which is now the White Memorial Conservation Center. Violetta was fluent in French, Italian, and German. She began an intensive study of mycology at the New York Botanical Garden in 1900 under the direction of Lucian Underwood. She corresponded with Peck, Merle, Lloyd, and others in her study of the gastromycetes. Her three important mycological publications were the Tylostomataceae of North America, Nidulariales of North America, and some Mount Desert Fungi. The Tylostomataceae include the stock puffballs. The Nidulariales include the bird's nest fungi. And her survey of mushrooms on Mount Desert Island, a part of Acadia National Park since 1929 at Bar Harbor, Maine, was a comprehensive list of her own collections with interpolated descriptions of new species by Charles Peck. And I, I, I would like to just to point out that this is a, an archival document on the left, and we always have to be careful whether they present the truth or whether there are mistakes. And it says she's given privileges of the collections from October 1st, 1902 until May 31st, 1902. Well, that's backwards. What, what is the truth? Was she there from May 31st, 1902 to October, or was she there from October 1902 to May 1903? I think it was the former, but um, that that kind of stood out when I was first examining that um, that certificate. The next three slides are scans of Violetta's studies recorded in notebooks in 1900. The first is the Marchantiaceae, a family of liverworts with the single genus Marchantia. Vascular plants have tissue that supports the movement of water and nutrients throughout the plant. Mosses and liverworts are non-vascular plants that lack such tissue, and they reproduce by spores, not seeds. Like mosses, liverworts do not have true leaves, stems, or roots. Violetta's notes here focus on the sexual anatomy of Estrella californica, a complex liverwort native to California. These drawings of cellular structure could only be done by using a microscope. This work was supervised by Lucian Underwood, a recognized expert of the liverworts. Pylobolus is a genus of zygomycetes known for its, its explosive discharge of spores. Its fruiting body functions like a primitive eye the dance troupe Palobolus Dance Theater takes its name from this unique fungus. Agaricus campestris is a popular edible mushroom 
the mushroom or the champignon of longstanding culinary interest. Violetta has labeled the stipe, annulus, mycelium, basidia, and spores of this well-known mushroom. Violetta's notebooks reveal that she studied the fungi systematically from the kingdom level through to family, genus, and species. Her sketches of fungal anatomy populated her study notes. She corresponded with William Merle long before he joined the garden as staff mycologist. Her many herbarium contributions are represented here in this specimen box cover of Leptoniella subplacida, a species named by Merle, which she collected in Bar Harbor in 1901 and described in the North American Flora Project. Leptonia and Leptoniella are typically not the first genera of mushrooms encountered by the beginner. These are Violetta's exquisite watercolors of these diminutive pink spored mushrooms formerly in the genus Entoloma. Microscopy became prevalent in mycology only in the last decades of the 19th century. Violetta used this compound microscope manufactured by Carl Reichert of Vienna in her studies of spores, spore ornamentation, and microscopic structures. This microscope in its mahogany case is on permanent display at Montgomery Place Historic Estate. Two volumes of Violetta's field notebooks are part of her archival collection at the New York Botanical Garden. I believe these are not really field notes, but rather her studies of the mycological literature relating to gastromycetes. With Underwood's tutelage, she began a study of the genus Geaster. In 1901, he recommended to her, quote, to get all our species separated as distinct things, end of quote, suggesting that the foreign determinations of other gastromycete specialists were unreliable. Violetta corresponded with Peck from 1901 to 1902 about gastromycetes and other fungi, sending him many specimens, often accompanied by her watercolor illustrations. In gratitude, Peck named Cortinarius Whitehay in her honor. Merle named several more for her, Scutiger Whitehay, Leptoniella whitea, Pluteus whitea, and Entoloma whitea. Today, these names are obsolete, reduced to synonymy with other valid names. This photo shows the type specimen of Quartinarius whitea in the New York Botanical Garden herbarium. A type specimen is preserved as a permanent reference to a new species. Violetta wrote to Peck, quote, the more I work on these plants, the more the fascination for them grows upon me. I only wish I could devote all my time to their study and collection." End of quote. In one of her last letters to Peck, she wrote, quote, "'It is so hard to put into words what one feels, but I must say again how much I appreciate your kindness to me. The little work I can do in botany and what it has brought into my life means so much to me." End of quote. And if you go to the New York Botanical Garden Herbarium, you can still see this very specimen in the herbarium, as you can with this. This is a well-known species, the toxic Rushula amedica, collected by Violetta, now in the New York Botanical Garden Herbarium. The cap color of these specimens is still fairly close to the original reddish color after 124 years. Violetta's collections are also uniquely significant when accompanied by her watercolor illustrations, which became vitally important when studying a type specimen, the actual specimen on which a species name is based. Her notes describing cap, stipe, spore color, etc., of Russia America accompany this illustration of July 9th, 1901. In her study of stocked puffballs, Violetta identified 11 new species of Tulastoma. Three were named by Underwood. She wrote, quote, the members of this family are puffball-like plants, which form underground in the shape of rounded masses, appearing at first on the mycelium as minute thickenings and gradually reaching their full development, end of quote. She included her own ink stippled drawings of fruiting bodies, hyphae, and spores in her article. Mycologists to the present day 
have admired the fine precision of these drawings. And note Violetta's initials, VSW, at the lower left of each panel. Violetta's successes in mycology co coincided with years of profound personal loss. In 1901, her brother, Arthur Eli White, died. Her father's illness and death followed late in 1903. In an undated letter, Underwood wrote to her, quote, I trust your splendid vitality will continue and that this summer will give rest to your overworked nervous system, end of quote. This sentiment seems to conform to the stereotype of the neurasthenic female, but Violetta's insecurities and pain were based in the reality of family illness. After her brother's death, she wrote strictly on morning stationery in her correspondence, letters edged in black, as this one written to Lloyd, and I will read this entire, entirely. Quote, November 24th, 1903. Dear sir, it gives me great regret that I have not had an opportunity to attend to the specimens you sent me, but owing to very serious illness in the family, it has been impossible for me to do so. However, now I hope to get at my microscope and will write you again shortly. My paper on the Tylostomatase, being my first effort in this line of work, is very faulty, and I hope that any work I might do now would be better deserving of consultation. Still, under present circumstances, I have been obliged to finish all work of mine. End of quote. And I believe her self-deprecating assessment also intimate, intimates rejection by the male science establishment of the time. Now, this is not an extraterrestrial avatar from the exoplanet Kepler-18b, but another gastromycete, Geaster fornicatum, whose vaulted form suggests its species name. The epithet fornicatum derives from the Latin fornix, meaning arch or vault, and a euphemism for a brothel in reference to prostitutes in ancient Rome waiting for customers under vaulted ceilings, hence the verb to fornicate. As one might expect, this fungal name gives rise to some scabrous humor, which I will not repeat in this lecture. What is pertinent is that this stippled drawing is an example of Violetta's punctilious artistry and authoritative study of a genus of fungi that she left uncompleted, the Geasters of North America. Her mycological work was cut short in 1904, and she recognized this as a permanent rupture in her scientific career. In June of 1904, she married John Ross Delafield. Hermione Lee, biographer of Edith Wharton, noted that in Victorian society, quote, veils, curtains, and layers of undergarments were meant to keep the family insulated against dangerous infections and to protect and infantilize the young girl, end of quote. So too, mature women of status and wealth might swaddle themselves in a Persian lamb fur coat with fox collar and muff, and a turban hat with a veil, like these worn by Mrs. Delafield. Her life was entirely transformed. She became a wife, and then a mother, and her allegiance to her family was paramount. She experienced four pregnancies. Three of her children predeceased her. Her daughter Sylvia died the day after birth. One bereavement followed another. Violetta's husband, John Ross Delafield, a graduate of Princeton and Harvard, was a formidable New York attorney who inherited the Montgomery Place estate in 1921. He was a commissioned officer in the U.S. Army, an anti-communist, and a vocal advocate for military preparedness, seen here in this 1923 photo, looming over all the others at six feet five inches tall. In 1917, during World War I, he organized and trained a corps of 1,400 men for the defense of New York City. He was also a genealogist, author of Delafield, A Family History. Violetta always addressed her letters to him, General John Ross Delafield. During the war, Violetta took Red Cross courses in first aid, as many women did. Her study notes in this subject are as meticulous as her earlier study of mycology. And just as a sidebar, I'd like to place this in the social context 
of the women's suffrage movement of the time. Carrie Chapman Catt, who is the mastermind of the suffrage victory and founder of the League of Women Voters, opposed American intervention in the war in part because she thought the war would be a setback for women's suffrage. Catt was also a pacifist. Now, I don't know Violetta's political beliefs on this, but she was guided by a philanthropic impulse her entire life with donations of fungi to herbaria, of rare books to botanical libraries, and during World War II, of thousands of books to servicemen overseas shipped out whenever requested. Montgomery Place was built in 1804 by Janet Livingston Montgomery, the widow of Richard Montgomery, the first general officer killed in the American Revolutionary War. Both Alexander Jackson Davis, an, the American architect, and Andrew Jackson Downing, founder of American landscape architecture, had roles in improving the mansion and the 434 acre estate. Both were associated with the Gothic revival. Montgomery Place boasts a commanding view of the Hudson River and its gardens are unique and various, thanks to Violetta. Violetta returned to mycology by way of her private studies of mushrooms, producing many fine watercolors in the years that the Delafield family summered, summered in Buck Hill Falls, Pennsylvania. There are hundreds of such watercolors. Most of the originals are held in the archive of the Montgomery Place campus of Bard College and others in herbarium collections of the New York Botanical Garden and New York State Museum. Her work on the watercolors peaked from 1919 to 1921. There are a mere handful through 1926. This falling off coincided with the death of her, her daughter Janet in 1922 and the family's relocation to Montgomery Place. Like another famous illustrator of mushrooms, Beatrix Potter, none of Violetta's paintings were ever publicly exhibited during her lifetime. This mushroom is in the genus Lactarius. In almost all of her watercolors, a summary of identifying characteristics describes the visual image, in this case, Ammonita frostiana. With this illustration, Violetta has written, Pileus, which is the cap, Pileus convex to expanding, bright yellow with remnant of vulva, two, lamellae, that is the gills, white, close, and free, spores white, stipe stuffed or hollow, bulbose, vulva tinged with yellow, veil also yellow and skirt-like, the name, Ammonita frostiana peck. This is from Litchfield, Connecticut. Violetta not only painted what she saw, she wrote what she saw. A written catalog of fungal anatomy parallels every image. These fruiting bodies of the Gastromyces phallogaster cicadas seem to me little wild imps from, from a cartoon scenario scattering across the page. These certainly qualify for inclusion among the mycologically strange. This is an earlier painting from Litchfield, Connecticut in 1900. These are stinkhorns. The species is Dictyophora duplicata. Stinkhorns come with a reputation. They are unmistakably phallic and repulsively putrid. Now, the Victorians had a problem with this. For example, Beatrix Potter painted plenty of fungi, but she entirely refused to paint stinkhorns. They apparently did not produce the same effect on Mrs. Delafield, especially since they belonged to her favorite group, the gastromycetes. This is Cantharellus flocosus from Buck Hill Falls, August, 1920. In the 1990s, I learned this marvelous fungus as Gompus flocosus. It was renamed yet again as Turbinellus flocosus in 2011. It is close to the genus Cantharellus the chanterelles. Here are a set of chanterelles, including Cantharellus infundibuliformis and Cantharellus cinnabarinus, which are popular edibles. I have no evidence that Violetta enjoyed eating mushrooms, although she often tasted a bit of mushroom cap 
to record what information it provides from the sensation of taste to help in identification. This is labeled Isaria farinosa, conidial stage of Cordyceps militarius. You can see that this fungus has parasitized an insect or grub. Conidial stage refers to asexual reproduction, a complicated matter involving a single species taking on two distinctly different forms, anamorph and teleomorph. Evidence of Violetta's systematic knowledge of mycology. Other than this anomaly, she painted primarily the agarics, gilled mushrooms. She also showed no evidence in polypores, no, no evident interest in polypores other than a single painting of Fistulina hepatica. I believe that Violetta's later portfolio of mushroom illustrations is her own personal allegory of her interrupted scientific career in mycology. This body of artwork is a survey of elegant and statuesque agaric mushrooms, a rendition of the picturesque from an ideal that strives to remain true to a scientific purpose. This mushroom is Coprinus comatus, the shaggy mane, seen here in four different moments of maturation, the gills turning inky in a unique method of spore dispersal known as deliquescence. Via Violetta did make a late attempt to come to terms with her unfinished work on Geaster in 1917, when she wrote to Nathaniel Britton about her manuscript, quote, read by dear Professor Underwood at some botanical gathering, and I think it was returned to me, but I have never been able to find it since, end of quote. Britton had no idea of the whereabouts of this manuscript. She asked him, however, to return her drawings because she valued them so highly. In 1920, she corresponded with William Murrell, who offered advice about preparing the manuscript for publication. However, his recommendations were quite onerous on the level of advice to a doctoral candidate writing a thesis. Since she had been separated from the intensity of such scholarship for over 15 years, the manuscript remained unpublished and she returned to the refuge of her private study of agarics through her watercolors at Buck Hill Falls. These are the first pages of the Giaster manuscript, which now resides in an unprocessed archival collection of the Violetta White Delafield papers in the archive of the, Mer of the Mertz Library of the New York Botanical Garden. The story of Violetta's mushrooms does not end in 1926 with her last watercolor and subsequent turn to horticulture. Her herbarium specimens continue to have fundamental value. In the 1980s, Rod Tullis, a nationally recognized expert on the genus Ammonida, received collections of a large Ammonida from Maine that fit no existing description. Rod traced and matched these collections to a mushroom that Violetta had collected in Bar Harbor in 1901, identified as Amanatopsis vaginata. Charles Peck described it from her watercolor as a varietal, naming it Amanatopsis vaginata variety Crassi Volveda in the very paper that Violetta had written on the Mount Desert fungi. Rod recognized that this large mushroom differed significantly from any known species in the unconserved genus Amanatopsis, and he renamed it Ammonida violetae in her honor. We see here her original painting and description from the New York Botanical Garden Herbarium, along with Rod's meticulous notes and spore size measurements. when he examined the collection in 1991 and published the new name with his findings in the journal Mycotaxon. I'm having difficulty here moving to the next slide. I'm sorry, bear with me. I, I'm stuck on this screen for some reason. I'm trying to get back to my original 
slide set here. There we go. Sorry. Don't know what happened there. Now, just a couple more slides left here. These are fragments of Violetta's original 1901 specimen of Amanita violetti at the New York Botanical Garden. While all the species named by Peck and Merle to honor her with the species name Whiteye have been reduced to synonymy with other valid names, the name Amanita violetti remains current and valid. The Delafields managed Montgomery Place together, of which there are detailed records in the Bard College archival collections. Violetta remained devoted to gardening and floral arrangement. Major differences in their aesthetics are evident here. John Ross's book plate design bristles with masculine energy and the trappings of warrior triumphalism. Duck hunting, yachting, muskets, a fight club of lines and vectors. Scarcely noticeable in the lower, lower right-hand corner are three tiny toadstools, a wink at his wife's strange interest and once promising career. By contrast, Violetta's flower arrangements are suffused with a subdued Orientalism and many won her public acclaim. A prominent member of the Millbrook New York Garden Club, she won first prize for an entry in the International Flower Show in 1934 and many winning entries thereafter. Her floral arrangements appeared in the World's Fair in 1940. The history of garden design at Montgomery Place deserves equal attention as her work in mycology, but it is beyond the scope of my survey here. One enduring accomplishment deserves mention. In 1935, Violetta and a colleague designed a wooden structure with bay windows and shelves for farm products. It was entered by the Millbrook Garden Club at an annual flower show at the Dutchess County Fair and won first prize. The Montgomery Place Wayside Fruit and Vegetable Stand is a local legend. It derived from Violetta's interest in improving the appearance of farm stands in a broader movement to beautify roadsides during the Great Depression. In 1937, First Lady Eleanor Roosevelt mentioned seeing this stand in the Rural Arts Agricultural Exhibition in Washington, D.C. And you can visit the Montgomery Place Orchards Farm Stand on Route 9G, where the bay windows of the original structure are evident. The years of World War II were overloaded with disasters for humanity and so too for Violetta. Her sister Lucy died in 1943 in Great Britain, and her second son Richard died of pneumonia in the Pacific Theater in 1945. Afterward, she wrote a final horticultural article, Plants That Survived the War Years, in 1946. She herself succumbed to emphysema in 1949. I believe that Violetta's intellectual and artistic endeavors after her early association with the New York Botanical Garden are marked by nostalgia for the mycological. To invoke the filmmaker Andrew Andre Tarkovsky, quote, nostalgia is not the same as longing for the past. Nostalgia is a longing for the space of time that has passed in vain, end of quote. But it would be presumptuous to believe that a wish to reverse time is a single interpretation of Violetta's truncated career, for there is much more to learn about her. Tarkovsky insisted that, quote, the preparatory discipline that art demands is not a scientific education, but a particular spiritual lesson. Art is born and takes hold wherever there is a timeless and insatiable longing for the spiritual, for the ideal, that longing which draws people to art." End of quote. For all her precision of method and intellectual rigor in the study of the fungi, I believe that Violetta Delafield was driven by an unstated spiritual quest. And finally, I'd like to express my gratitude to all those who assisted with this presentation. I could not have completed this without the expert knowledge and generous assistance of everyone listed here. And I'd like to point out too, in particular, Laura Kuhn, who is the director of the John Cage Trust at Bard College, um, started 
John Cage Mycology Day in, 19, in 2018 and 2019. And uh, Barbara Tears was the director of the herbarium of the New York Botanical Garden and very supportive of this, of this project. So with that, I bring it to a close. I thank you for attending. Uh, I'm sorry for the little glitch there at the end, but we figured that out. And if anyone is interested in contacting me for, um, for anything having to do with this talk or for Women's History Month at the library or the archive of the New Rochelle Public Library, please feel free to, free to do so at my personal email address or my, li my library email address. And thanks to Lisa for making this happen. And I wish you all a wonderful afternoon. And if there are any questions, Lisa, please direct yep. them to me. We, we have a few. Um, Karen asked if there is a biography on Violetta. And I did a quick look on Libby <laughs> to see what I could find either in Westchester or uh, New York public system. And I couldn't find anything, but David, you may know better. To my knowledge, there is no full biography of Violetta White Delafield. Uh, my interest in biography and mycology uh, is, it basically results in articles like the one that I wrote about Violetta for Fungi Magazine. I can send that to you. It's some um, six or eight pages long, but that hardly, um, uh, does anything to the her 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 life her life story outside of mycology? Um, mm -hmm. The Delafield family papers, which I looked at at Princeton University, there were two boxes of of documents relating to mycology, and many many more boxes about the family. So I di I didn't even look at that. I didn't have time to do so because I usually work on multiple projects and never get things finished. So. Um, someone needs to write a biography of her. She's, she's a fascinating person, and I've briefly skimmed the surface of her life just by concentrating on her interest in the gastro gastromycetes. Um, Barbara asks, what will be the future of this work? Publications, displays at New York Botanical? Oh, well, um, you'll, you'll probably get more more projects, pro programs, and productions from uh, the archivist at Bard College. Uh, in 2019, we did uh, John Cage Mycological Weekend focusing on both John Cage and Violetta. And um, it was very well received. And there was, uh, there was a, a nice display in the Bard College Library. Um, and the, the small collection of her work at the New York Botanical Garden Archive. I don't know it, that it has been processed. When I worked there, I didn't even know it existed. It came out of the, the woodwork long afterwards. So um, I would, I would uh, contact Montgomery Place and, um, and, and the library at Bard College to know about um, any other productions that may come up, such as exhibits regarding her life. I know you can, uh, you know, if you're a, a serious uh, investigator or researcher, you can, Make an appointment yourself, just like you can make an appointment with me if you're interested in anything about New Rochelle um, re relating to the archive that uh, that that is curated. So that's the best I can answer to that. Okay, and we have a um, a recommendation to visit Montgomery Place on Bard College campus. It's lovely. You're here. And um, yes. uh, Susan shared that Violetta's grandson and great granddaughter watched this and enjoyed it very much. So thank you for well, being here. I, I am honored and humbled that they yeah. did. I, you know, I, I never expected that. And um, uh, that's a wonderful thing in itself. So uh, please accept my thanks for, for listening this afternoon. Okay, and Barbara asks, I found it interesting to learn recently that fungi are neither plants nor animals. I would guess they are vulnerable to climate change. Any comments on that? Well, they're not plants or animals, even though in the lecture that are in the presentation that I just gave, Violetta referred to them as plants. That's kind of a colloquial thing. It's not technically correct. Fungi are their own kingdom. And that it took a lot um, uh, for science to really come to that conclusion. So um, as, as 
regarding climate change, there's a lot going on and I'm really not knowledgeable about that. However, I can say from 30 years experience of watching fungi and getting excited over the next mushroom that I see at the, at, at the curbside, I have seen Southern species migrate North. That Lepiota, the Chlorophyllum molybdites, we first found as in Cape May, uh, New Jersey. And I never saw it up here in Westchester. And for the past 10 years, I've seen it all the time here in, in, in conspicuous profusion. So um, I believe there, there is something going on uh, in terms of uh, understanding how mushrooms are, um, are susceptible to the warming of the planet and um, there's, a, there's a lot to be said about that, but I'm, I'm really not knowledgeable about that subject. I will turn to birds for a second. If you go to um, the Audubon uh, website that lists uh, identifications of birds, it's a marvelous website. They have a feature with every bird species of how the, how the environments and the, and the, and the, the, the range, the, the geographic range of each bird species uh, is changing due to climate control, so, or due to climate um, uh, problems, so. But that's birds, not mushrooms. And then there is a question, will there be a recording of this? Yes, this was recorded, and we just need to edit out some of the beginning before the actual presentation started, and then I can send it out to everyone who registered for the program. Okay, so just some comments of thank you. It's a thrill to see a real old school botanist illustrations and notes. Thank you. Number of yes, I am old school for sure. <laughs> yes, a lot thank you for thank, thank you for attending, everyone. I appreciate it. Yeah, thank any, you, thank you, Lisa. Yeah, and I'm just gonna put a call. Any last questions? Anyone? I mean, even if you want to turn your camera on, we're not a huge group, so can be casual. Or put it in the chat. Okay, no, no questions coming. So I think uh, I think that's it. And again, thank you, thank you, David. Thank you, everyone, for taking time out of your day to join us. And I was struck personally by how beautiful the mushrooms, particularly the photographs you showed early on, are. And then Violetta's watercolors. I, I had never really looked that closely at the beauty of mushrooms. So thank you. Thanks. All right. Um, we hope to see you at future programs. Check out nrpl.org. And uh, we have lots of great stuff coming up. Enjoy the rest of the weekend.